Brothers and sisters, before we uh, get to our sermon, let's read a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In this passage, we learn about death, that death is not good, that death is the result of sin, and that death without Christ is very, very powerful. But this passage tells us that because of Christ, death no longer has any power over his people. So let's start in verse 51, and the context of this is talking about the resurrection. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death! Where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We have a sister who died yesterday. But death is not the final word for her. Death, although powerful and although an occasion for great sorrow, because death is not good, death is evil, our bodies and our spirits were not meant to be separate by death. Although death is an occasion for mourning, it is not the final word. We have great confidence, brothers and sisters, that our sister is with the Lord. And just notice in verse 54 and 55, this poetic three lines, you can almost hear Paul mocking death. Oh, death, where is your victory? For the Christian, we can look at death not with utter fear, but with confidence because Christ gives us the victory. Therefore, this passage says we should abound in the work of the Lord. So when we have just heard that our sister has passed away, yes, we mourn, but we also rejoice because that is not the final word. But we're also encouraged that those who are left, the 80, 90 people who are here today, we are called, therefore, to be steadfast, to be immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that death is not the last word. That death, something that is very, very fearful, is no longer fearful for those who are in you. And Arlene was in you. Her death happened 2,000 years ago at the cross. And she will be resurrected soon. And we are so thankful for that reality. Help us as a church congregation to mourn, but to mourn well as those who have hope. And help us to be immovable. Help us to love our former pastor with great, great passion. Let Raise up our church to abound in the work of the Lord, which means in this occasion showing great love to Jerry. Move our church this week to send flowers and letters and phone calls and text messages to this man that we love. And again, we are thankful that this is not the last word. In Jesus' name, amen. One other announcement. Uh, many of you knew or know that I was in Phoenix on Friday. I presented a paper at a conference, and it went really well. And there was over 500 people there, uh, church members who wanted to learn about uh, the books that are in our Bible, and can we trust the words? Because a lot of arguments say you can't trust the Bible. It's been changed too many times. So myself and six other people presented papers at this conference. And I think that the people who attended were, were encouraged in the Lord and walked away uh, with, with a greater conviction that when they preach the word of God and teach the word of God, they could truly say 
thus says the Lord. So thank you for your prayers and all your support. Uh, you definitely had, uh, are going to, an, going to harvest fruit from that. So I'm thankful for, for your prayers and your kindness. With that said, let's now get to our sermon. We are in Genesis chapter 14, and uh, the sermon title is The King of God's Kingdom. And children, at this moment, you guys can be dismissed for children's church. All right, the perfect word of our God that has been preserved for us without error and is meant for us to be transformed says to us in Genesis 14, in the days of Amraphael, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Calda Lamor, king of Elam, and Tidel, king of Goim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Admah, Shemaber, king of Zebulun, and the, kings of, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. And all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the sea salt. Twelve years they had served Caldela Mer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year of uh, Kedor Lemer, and the kings who were with him uh, came and defeated the Rephilim in Ashtaroth uh, Karnim, and the Zuzim in Ham, the Anim in Sheva Kerathim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishfat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazan Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Ze- Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Siddim with Caldelamer, king of Elam, Tidel, king of Goim, and Raphael, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled into the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions and went their way. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living at the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Ishkol and Anar. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions, and also brought back his kinsmen Lot with his possessions, and the women, and the people." After his return from the defeat of uh, uh, Kedor Lemer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but the young men, but what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me, let Anar, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. Thus says the word of the Lord. This is God's inspired word, and I wonder if these, some of these kings' names are in here just to humble pastors. <laughs> it's quite a mouthful, right? Well, it's extraordinary when we see a leader who actually leads for the good of the people he's leading. We often see the leaders of this world who lead for their own good. 
They lead in order to protect themselves. They lead in order to gain resources to indulge themselves. This is a travesty, but it's all too common. We see, for example, instances in Africa where there are dictators who embezzle billions of dollars and drive around in bulletproof Mercedes-Benz. When children on that same street are dying of malnourishment. We have seen dictators, when they fall, living in impoverished countries who have expensive sports car collections. It's very easy for the leaders of this world to use their position to indulge themselves. Therefore, it is extraordinary when you see a leader who leads for the good of those whom he is leading. That's what we see in Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, we see a battle take place between five kings who live near the Dead Sea, south of the Dead Sea, who go to battle against four powerful kings of the east. These are the big, bad kings of this area, and there is a battle. But Moses does not record this chapter for us for a history lesson. The purpose of us having this in the Bible is not so that we could just know that roughly in 2100 BC, there is a battle between four kings of the east and five weak kings of the south. That's not the point. The point of Moses recording for us this historical event is to show us a picture of what the king of God's kingdom looks like. We have learned that God creates the world in order to establish his kingdom on earth. We've learned about God's word, how he reigns over his kingdom. We've learned about the people of God's kingdom, and we've learned about, about an alternative kingdom, the kingdom of the snake, and how the snake tempts us to join his kingdom. We've learned about all of that as we've been studying in the book of Genesis. Last week, we learned that despite sin, which is evil and grotesque and extensive, Sin will not derail God's plan. God will establish his kingdom on earth. And it will be established through Abraham and his offspring. We learned that last week. And now in this chapter, we get some details about what the king of this kingdom will look like. The main idea of this sermon is that the king of God's kingdom uses his power and his strength for his people's joy and for God's glory. Therefore, we should bless this king. The first detail we learn about the king of God's kingdom is that he uses his strength to serve his weak kinsmen. This is evident in verses 13 through verse 16. We see that Moses communicates to us that Abram is a powerful man. He is very, very powerful. First, he is able to... Uh, to raise up a 318-man army. Now, that might not seem like much nowadays. I mean, we probably have our Green Berets that are more than 318. Our special forces eclipse this number. But in 2100 BC, a 318-man army is actually uh, quite a powerful army. Abram's able to raise up a 318-man army. And notice what verses 14 through 15 tell us about this army. It says that these men are trained. Abram doesn't merely raise up 318 peasants or 318 farmers or blacksmiths. He raises up 318 trained military soldiers. And notice something else about Abram in verse 15. He's, a, he is a, he's very strategic in his military endeavors. Notice in verse 15 it says he divides his forces by night. A nighttime ambush. That is a very successful uh, military uh, strategy. That's exactly what Abram does. So we learn that Abram's a powerful man. He has the ability to raise up a 318 man army of trained people, and he's able to employ a military strategy upon four kings of the east that are the big bad muscles of the ancient Near East. This is a powerful man. But notice that Abram uses his power not to indulge himself. The last time we learned anything about Lot was in verse thir chapter 13, 
And what we learned about Lot was that he's quite selfish. So if you remember in Genesis 13, and this, uh, my small ears, let's see, I must have shrunk over the weekend. I was in Phoenix. Maybe they're dehydrated. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Um, I'll have to tilt my head a little bit like this for the rest of the sermon. Let's see here. Okay. Um, the last thing we learned about Lot is he's quite selfish. If you remember, Lot and Abram are both herdsmen, and uh, they have a lot of cattle. And the land's not sufficient for them to all graze their cattle. So their herdsmen are starting to argue and quarrel. And Abram says, hey, we're kinsmen. We're family. Let's not quarrel. Look, lift up your eyes and pick, pick whatever you want to go, and I'll go in the opposite direction. And what does Lot do? He lifts up his eyes, and he's, he sees the best place. And he says, I'll take that place. There's no discussion. He doesn't say, you know, Abram, you know, the Jezreel Valley, that's a nice area. How about you take that place? He doesn't even say, hey, you know, the Jezreel Valley is a good place for us to have our herds. Maybe we could divide that area. No, he just says, I'll take that place. So notice now that when Abram re- hears that his kinsman, that selfish lot, is taken captive, he doesn't respond with vindictiveness. He doesn't say, serves you right. You knew that those people of Sodom were big-time sinners. You shouldn't have taken that spot. He doesn't respond with anger. He responds with faithful love and loyalty. What does Abram do? He raises up his 318-man army, and he goes on a dangerous expedition. Four powerful kings that could smite a 318-man army. Yes, a 318-man army isn't, isn't, isn't peanuts in the ancient world, but you have four big bad kings who just went on a military adventure and who conquered everybody along the entire way. He's going to war against that. And he doesn't ask any questions. The way Moses portrays it is he hears what has happened and he goes. And he goes as far as Dan, which is the most northern place of the region. So he goes with passion and fervency to a very far location to protect his kinsmen. So what we're learning here is that Abram uses his strength and his power not to indulge himself. He uses his strength and his power to serve his weak kinsmen. What a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We serve a God. We serve a king who reigns over God's kingdom, who doesn't use his position to indulge himself. That's what the gods of this world do. That's what the kings of this world do. That's not our God. Our God came to this earth not to be served, but to serve. We see that the king of God's kingdom, he takes the most humblest positions. Jesus has always been God, and he humbles himself and takes on flesh, being now fully God and fully man. He dies the most humiliating death possible to serve you and me. We are weak. We are not able to serve ourselves. But this is what Christ does. So the king of God's kingdom, I need a smaller earpiece, I think. The king of God's kingdom uses his strength to serve his weak people. That's what Abram does, and that points us forward to the gospel of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. The second thing we learn about the king of God's kingdom is that the king embodies righteousness for the glory of God. The king of God's kingdom embodies righteousness for the glory of God. We see this clear in verse 17 through 24. The first piece of evidence that indicates this is that Abram identifies with Melchizedek. Notice in verse 17, we see that after the defeat of Cal uh, de la Mer <laughs> and the kings who were with him, we see that two kings approach Abram. Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, the priest of God Most High, and the king of Sodom. Now, who is Melchizedek? Melchizedek is a Canaanite king priest. So, in this region, they used to worship one god. And the king would also be a priest. But then this region devolved into polytheism, awful worship practices of Baal, uh, awful religion. But before that, they were monotheistic. So Melchizedek is a human king priest, 
but he's not like the kings of the ancient Near East. His name means king of righteousness, and the author of Hebrews makes an important point about that. Melchizedek means king of righteousness, and he is the king of Salem. He is the king of peace. Notice that he does not go to war. The five kings fight the four kings, and Melchizedek does not go to war. And notice what Abram does. He identifies with Melchizedek. We see that in that Melchizedek brings out bread and water. Ally kings, after battle, they would dine together, indicating that they're allies. We see a close connection between Abram and Melchizedek. Also, Melchizedek blesses Abram, and Abram gives him a tenth. We see that Abram is identifying with the type of kingship embodied in Melchizedek. Now, we also see something very important in verses 19 through 20. Abram's loyalty to Lot, which is righteousness. It is right for God's people to be faithful and loyal to one another. Leads Melchizedek to bless God. Abram's righteous living in being loyal to Lot, even when it meant his potential death, causes God to receive Amazing glory. Let's read again verses 19 through 20. These are the words of Melchizedek. He says, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Do you notice what just happened? Verse 19, after the introduction, uh, the first words of Melchizedek is, Blessed be Abram. But now notice verse 20. And blessed be God. Do you see the connection here? The connection is exactly what we're supposed to see. Melchizedek, Melchizedek recognizes that Abram is blessed by God. And that causes Melchizedek to bless God. So what did Melchizedek recognize about God or recognize about Abram? He recognized that God fights for Abram. The God of the universe, the God that Abram serves is the kind of God who fights for his people. That's what it means to be blessed. For Abram to be blessed, it means that he just doesn't have tanks on his side. He has the God of this universe on his side. That's what it means to be blessed. And when Melchizedek sees Abram being blessed, that God fights for him, guess what Melchizedek does? He blesses God. So here's, here, and that's the point. Why was Abram blessed? So that the nations might be blessed. So what does it mean to bless God? That is a very peculiar term. Because we know what it's like to be blessed, right? We say it all the time. Oh, bless you. <laughs> or, oh, um, how are you doing today? I'm blessed. What, is, what does that mean? Typically, we mean we're doing fine, or maybe even better than fine. Fine on steroids. We're doing well. But what does it mean to bless God? right? What does it mean to bless the God who owns everything? It says, possessor of heaven and earth. How can you bless God? We bless God when we enrich God's reputation. You see, our God is the God of everything. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. He reigns supreme over every heart and over every single throne, over every single leader, and over every single wannabe God in this universe. Our God reigns supreme. And yet there are people right now who are not worshiping our God. There are people right now who are finding their security and safety in a bank account number. They're worshiping money. We have right now People are finding their worth and their security in sexual relations. When people do that, seeking to find their safety and security in anything outside of God, what they're doing is enriching another's reputation. If you live for money, you're proclaiming to the world, money's the best. Money is the best. You're enriching the reputation of money. It ought not to be. Money's reputation ought not be the best. God must have the best reputation, for he is the God of the universe. So you and I have the ability to enrich God's reputation when we make 
a reality now what's a reality in heaven. So you and I can bless the God of this universe by enriching his reputation. How do we do that? Well, how did Abram do that? God fought for him. Is God fighting for you? How has God fought for us, brothers and sisters? Most clearly at the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, Abram was defeat, uh, what God fought for Abram uh, and defeated four powerful kings. But those kings are dwarfs compared to the enemy we have. We don't just have a physical enemy. We have a spiritual enemy who not just has the ability to take us captive physically, but we have an enemy who has the power to take you captive spiritually in hell forever. That's the enemy we have. And if you're in Christ, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, then you have been delivered from that enemy. So do your lost friends and neighbors and family members look at your life and say, God fights for you. If they do, they will see an incredibly attractive picture of our God and what a reputation that is. What a reputation. You see, for God to be powerful enough to judge you and me, that's a reputation, right? It demonstrates God has power. But what about this reputation? God not only has the power to judge sinners, God has the power to save sinners. God delights. What about this reputation? The God of this universe delights in fighting for sinners like you and me. That is the greatest reputation there is. Can there be anything better than that? And we get it. Because when, uh, when we see Saddam Hussein, who had luxury cars galore, and he falls, we scorn him. But when we see a leader who uses his power and his resources to serve the weak, we bless that person. We get it. This is the best reputation ever. Announce this to your lost friends, to your lost neighbors to your lost family members. Brothers and sisters, are you enriching God's reputation? Are you enriching the reputation of another? If you're finding your security and safety in anything besides the blood of Jesus, you are a threat, and I am a threat to God's reputation. Let's not let that be, brothers and sisters. You see, Abram, he was in a dangerous, a very uh, peculiar situation. Go up against these bad bad bad, mean kings from the east, I might die. No, he prized faithfulness and loyalty by his righteous living. Melchizedek saw that God fights for Abram, and he blessed God. So let's think about that just for a moment. When you and I live like we were called to live, we see God fighting for us, and our lost, maybe even spouses, our lost neighbors see something incredibly attractive. So remember the main point of this lesson is that we serve a God who fights for his people. We, the king of God's kingdom uses his strength and his resources for the, your good. Therefore, bless him. Live for him. Proclaim him to the lost people around you. Enrich his reputation for your joy and for God's glory. Now, the next way we see uh, that the king of God's kingdom embodies righteousness for the glory of God is found in that Abram, uh, he does not identify with the king of Sodom. So notice in verse, uh, in verse 21, let's read verse 21 through 23 again. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything else that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. We see in this passage an alternative definition of righteousness. Righteousness, according to the king of Sodom, is might makes right. And that's what the kings of this world think. See, the king of Sodom says to Abram, you had the muscles to get these things back, so keep them for yourself. 
you have the strength to, ha- to win these goods in battle, therefore they're yours. This is might makes right righteousness, and that's not the righteousness of God's kingdom. Might does not make right. If you have the ability to do it, therefore you could do it, that's not righteousness in God's kingdom. Righteousness in God's kingdom is using your strength not to indulge yourself, king of Sodom, that's what he thinks, but using your strength and your resources to serve the weak. That is righteousness in God's kingdom. So you know what? notice what Abram does. He says, I've taken an oath that I'm not going to take anything that belongs to you, lest you say, I have made Abram rich. You see what Abram's doing here? Uh, Abram is committed to true righteousness. He will not engage even for a moment with the king of Sodom because if he takes these things from the king of Sodom, the king of Sodom could say, I made you rich. God didn't make you rich. I made you rich. See what's happening here? Is that when we as God's people adopt the righteousness of this world, when we adopt the idea that, oh, uh, might makes right, if I have the money to do, whatever, to do whatever I want, then I have the right to do it. When we adopt that kind of mentality, what we're seeing here, when we adopt that kind of mentality, we see in this passage uh, that we are a threat to God's reputation. You see, Abram is very concerned that everybody around, around him knows who made him rich. It's not the king of Sodom by might makes right righteousness. It was God by means of kindness. That's how Abram got rich. So brothers and sisters, if there is any habit in your life of getting rich by the means of this world, you are bringing scorn to God's reputation. So what are some ways that we could seek riches according to the righteousness of this world? First, uh, you, could, you could steal. You're getting rich by stealing. And you, if you're doing that, you are bringing scorn to God. If you're a workaholic and you're making money because you're working and sacrificing your family, you are bringing scorn to God's reputation. If you are lazy and you expect people to provide for you and you don't have to work, you are bringing scorn to God's reputation. If you are... If you cheat on your taxes... If you have the idea that because I have resources, I can indulge myself, what we're doing is we are bringing scorn to God's reputation. What is making you rich is not God, but it is the ways of this world. And that will never end in your joy, and it will never end in God being blessed. You see, we serve a God who is the king of his own kingdom. We serve a God who uses his strength to serve the weak. We serve a king who embodies righteousness for his own glory and for our joy. That's the king we serve. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let's forsake the righteousness of this world. And let's embrace with joy the righteousness of God. Let's use our resources to care for one another, and let's then watch this lost community all around us come to know God. Do you want our lost friends at Baldy View Elementary? Do you want your lost friends in your workplace and your lost family members to come to know the Lord? Then live a life where it's clear to them that it's God who's fighting for you. It's not you who's fighting for yourself. And it's not this world that's fighting for you. When we engage in that, brothers and sisters, this world can do nothing other than bless the God who deserves the richest reputation of all. So for the glory of God's reputation, 
for your own joy and for the joy of the lost. Let's, indic- let's reveal to this world that God fights for us. Let's pray. God, you are good and you delivered Abram from his enemies. And you have delivered us from our enemies. Help us, Lord, please help us not to be like the king of Sodom. Help us to be like Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, a king of peace. Let us be the type of people who spread peace in this world and who are righteous in our living so that when this world sees us, they might see the God of this universe that they were meant to enjoy. Let them see you, I pray for my brothers and sisters today, that they would be encouraged with great passion to live for your glory for the sake of your reputation. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.